everyone. I'm John Korstein. I'm Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center, and it's my infinite pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, we're really going to deal with the whole concept of European-built ironclads, the CSS Stonewall being the only example of a European-built ironclad that actually got commissioned by the Confederate Navy. They tried very hard, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of things working against them. You know, so as soon as the war broke out, very fortunately for the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis selects a fairly dynamic individual uh, to become, you know, Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy. And his name is Stephen Russell Mallory. Now, what makes Mallory so important is that he had, uh, he was a, before the war, he was a senator uh, from Florida. He, uh, of course, resigned from the Senate and became uh, a secretary of the war. But he had been on the Senate's Committee on the Conduct of Naval Affairs. So Mallory had amassed a certain amount of information that really uh, gave him a heads up in uh, kind of being a visionary for what do we need to win this war? Um, now, you know, he was from Key West, Florida, born in Trinidad. Uh, he, at an age 19, became collector of customs at uh, Key West. Um, he fought in the Seminole War. He uh, actually um, was, while Secretary of the Navy, he, I'm um, not, not secretary, while he was um, chairman of the committee on the conduct of um, naval affairs through the U.S. Senate, he actually set up the retirement board, which ended up having a lifelong enemy in uh, Matthew Fontaine Mari, who we're going to deal with a little bit today. Uh, then also, we, uh, uh, he, he is going to actually put forward this ironclad construction project that happened before the war, which is known as the Stevens Battery. Sadly, the Stevens battery never really became an effective ship uh, because of changes in ordnance, because of changes in iron construction, so that it will later be actually here in Hampton Roads as the Naugatuck and fought at the Battle of Drury's Bluff. But that's an F. But Mallory knows about this. And he immediately wrote Jefferson Davis. I propose to adopt a class of vessels heretofore unknown to naval service. The perfection of a warship would doubtless be a combination of the greatest known ocean speed with the greatest known float and battery and power of resistance. He believed that if you got an ironclad um, and you armed it with a ram and with a uh, rifled guns, you would give the South an advantage. Um, and uh, uh, he wrote uh, again, I regard the possession of an iron armored ship as a matter of the first necessity. Such a vessel at this time could traverse the entire coast of the United States prevent all blockades, encounter with a fair prospect of success their entire Navy. And, and this is, to cope with them on sea, he went further. We follow their example and build wooden ships. We shall have to construct several at one time for one or two ships would fall an easy prey to their comparatively numerous steam frigates but inequality of numbers may be compensated um, by um, the construction of ironclads. So not only does economy, but naval success dictate the wisdom and expediency of fighting with iron against wood without regard to final cost. Although iron ship construction's not new by 1861, it, uh, because of the introduction of the shell gun to naval um, warfare, really meant the death knell for wooden, well, number one, wooden sailing ships and any, any type of wooden steamer um, because of how these shells enacted. In fact, we get to observe everything about this during the Crimean War.
when the Russians win the great victory at Sinope uh, in November of 1853. Um, then the French and the English, when they can't use their wooden ships to operate against the forts defending Sevastopol on the Black Sea, right? It's what's called Kinburn. So what they'll do is build what are called floating batteries. Now these um, floating batteries are going to uh, be known as the Lav class. And they got four inch iron plating. They actually have, uh, they're underpowered. Uh, they can only go 220 horsepower. So that's not very good. They were about 100, they were 167 feet in length and a draft of eight feet. But because they're underpowered, they have to be towed into action. But when they are, they are basically shot proof. And uh, in fact, uh, the French, lose just a few men killed during this action at Kinburn on 17 October 1855. And with a range of 800 yards, the Russian batteries shot bounce harmlessly off the sides of the French floating batteries. And the men that are killed um, are actually from a shot coming into a gun port. They forgot to build port shutters. So, you know, but that doesn't matter. What that proves is the superiority of iron over wood. Now, even though the Lav class was successful, they knew, the French and, of course, the English, knew that they had to build uh, even better ironclads. And so, uh, uh, you know, the French designer uh, Stanislas Henry Laurent Dupy de Lome, chief constructor of the Imperial Navy, used all this experience to build the first ironclad frigate, the um, Glorie. Now, this thing was 253 feet in length. Um, it is going to combine speed, firepower, and uh, um, you know, speed, firepower uh, is what you need and level of resistance. So the La Glorie is a type of vessel that is exactly what Mallory is conceiving. Uh, the English, not to be undone, they are going to build their own ironclads. They saw a major ironclad construction program, uh, which actually two ships were already under construction in 1861, the HMS Warrior and the HMS Black Prince. What I love about the Warrior is that um, this thing was an all iron vessel, right? Um, and uh, with, it had four and a half inches of armor belt, which was backed by 18 inches of teak. It actually mounted 10, 110 pounder and four 70 pounder Armstrong breech loading rifles. Oh my gosh. So, so once again, superiority in armament, superiority in protection. So it also had 26, 68 pounder muzzle loader smooth bores. So this ship was capable of making 17.5 knots. The warrior, in essence, could escape anything it could not destroy. Wow. So Mallory uh, was all aware of all this and he uh, paid attention because he knew that the ironclads were the solution for the Confederacy. However, um, they decided to right away, the Committee of Naval Affairs Confederate, uh, led by Congressman William P. Chilton of Alabama, said that he wanted the government to inquire uh, into the purchase of iron-plated frigates and such iron-plated gunboats as may be necessary to protect the commerce and provide the safety of the Confederacy in England and France. John Mercer Brook, basically the designer for the CSS Virginia, uh, will actually say that an iron-plated ship might be purchased in France, loaded with arms and brought into port in spite of the wooden blockade. 
Well, this is really uh, pretty important because the Confederates realized they lacked the infrastructure to really build effective ironclads. They have engine problems, they have armor problems or production of iron. Uh, they do make the best guns. Then they also come up with the concept of RAM. The RAM, uh, as I like to tell people, they stopped using the RAM in um, uh, 1571 after the Battle of Lepanto. So if I'm shot proof, I can ram everybody. This man, James Dinwiddie Bullock, a native of Georgia, uh, who was in the U.S. Navy, then served as a merchant uh, ship captain uh, involved in mercantile interests in New York. Uh, I, I have to just add, he is the uncle of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I always say that, you know, just because it sounds impressive. So anyway, Brooks' letter made a big impact on Bullock. Bullock's job was to try and get ships of the most modern description built. Um, and so Mallory is going to send this man, um, Bullock, as well as this other person, Lieutenant John North. And I have to tell you, John North is lazy. He really does not. He's not as diligent as Bullock will be. And as a result of that, you know, North will spend time trying to build this what's called ship number 61, some people refer to it as a Santa Maria. Um, it is never named as a Confederate ship and it is never finished. Uh, the man that's effective is this man because he recognizes right away that we gotta have what? Uh, we gotta have an ironclad. Now this is um, a, a sketch of what the Bullock will arrange to construct in Great Britain at the Lard Brothers shipyard uh, outside of Liverpool, Birkenhead. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, this is going to be really a major impact because Bullock knows, um, you know, after the Battle of Ironclads, that monitors need to be destroyed. So what do we have here? We have, if you take a look, um, we basically have a ship that is got a built-in ram. It's also got twin turrets. Actually, you know, it, it has a, um, a iron shield that can drop down so you can fire your turrets. Um, the turrets have a pretty good range of fire. Of course, we're still stuck on sails. Uh, but this uh, is going to be... Uh, uh, very important. So, um, Bullock had already had success. Bill, uh, he purchased a ship called the Fingal, uh, which was a blockade runner, Iron Hull, that made it in Savannah with 10,000 stands of arms, etc. It eventually became the ironclad Atlanta. But I'll tell you, Bullock was not satisfied with that. Now, just remember, he's working with the banking house of Fraser, Tretton and Company, uh, and he's going to construct numerous commerce raiders, uh, the most famous being hull number 290, known as the Enrica, uh, that will be eventually known as the Alabama. I think I've already talked about that in some prior sessions. Um, and he also arranged for the construction of the Florida in a but you know, supposedly the Florida is being made for the Italian Navy. There's all these problems that the Confederates are going to face building blockade, I mean, ironclads. And, and so we got commercial cruisers we can do, blockade runners, but naval success could only be achieved if the South acquired European constructed ironclads to operate along the southern coast and break the Union blockade. You know, his success getting the uh, Bullock success getting the Alabama and the Florida out to sea made him seek to create these contracts with the Lard brothers. Now, Bullock made some mistake at first because guess what? He signs the contracts as him, himself. So you have uh, a ship that is designed 
Uh, you can see um, uh, there is one example of it. Um, and um, so actually there's these problems. Now there's active neutrality and also the Foreign Enlistment Act. And the Foreign Enlistment Act basically said Great Britain, Britain could not build any ships or arm any ships or allow any of its citizens to participate in two recognized nations at war. Well, the British didn't recognize the Confederacy. However, they did indeed recognize the United States, despite the Trent Affair and other things um, that they want to be on good terms with the United States. This ship is supposed to counter monitors. Now, um, how can it do that? Um, well, I'll come back to him. Well, it's a bigger ship. It's got the ram. It's got superior armor. Now, not as much, you know, the turret of a monitor, eight in, well, the monitor was eight inches of, or eight layers of one inch iron plate. So here we have uh, uh, a ship that uh, has superior resistance and actually better guns. So this becomes very, very important. So he signs a contract with Lard and Sons. And so the cost of each ironclad, 93,750 pounds. Um, and these were designed to overwhelm any monitor. The ironclads were named the CSS North Carolina, which is Hull 294, and the CSS Mississippi, which is Hull 295. Work proceeded rapidly. Uh, however, this guy is not going to be happy about it. And this is Charles Francis Adams. Yes, grandson of a president, son of a president. He is a uh, minister ambassador to Great Britain. And he pesters um, the British government about the, the Rams, who owns them, and the fact of the Foreign Enlistment Act. So, uh, Lord Russell, then Foreign Secretary, uh, who was actually somewhat sympathetic uh, to the Confederacy, advised Bullock, look, you made a big mistake, you got him in your name, uh, Adams knows about it, so you need to um, do something else. So he creates this bogus sales agreement using the bank and French banking firm of Brevet, um, and they noted that these ironclads were being pur purchased uh, for the uh, um, uh, the Khedive of Egypt, and uh, which made kind of sense, I reckon. And so the North Carolina became the El Tucson, and uh, oh gosh, and the Mississippi, known as the El Monster. Um, would um, become this Confederate, this British ironclad. And, and notice its excellence in construction. You see how the um, boards are, uh, or the iron plates are knocked down. So you have full field of fire for your monitors. You can't see the ram, but this is a powerful ship. So Adams actually convinced Lord Russell, said, look, you got to confirm that the Khedive of Egypt is wanting to buy these ironclads. And so Russell did, and the Khedive of e uh, Egypt says, huh, what? No, I wasn't. And so um, that means the British now, you know, the news of the Alabama, the Florida, those commerce raiders' success um, are making the British look bad. So Lord Russell is going to have to stop the contract and actually purchase the ships for the Royal Navy. And uh, uh, that is the end of this opportunity that the British thought they had, or the, uh, the uh, uh, Confederacy thought they had. Uh, I mean, you know, when you compare this ship to a monitor, let's just look at a couple of things. They're bigger than a monitor, 224 feet in length. They're faster, speed of 10.5 knots, you monitor seven knots. Better armored, the turrets had 10 inches back by teak. And better firing platforms because they're using what are called Coles turrets. And these are turrets invented by copper cows uh, who actually uh, worked differently than Ericsson's and were superior to the Ericsson-designed turret.
Um, so basically they had nine inch rifles, which are better than a 15 inch shell gun. And so could these ships have broken the blockade becomes the big question. And the answer is, well, probably not. They could have sank many monitors, but there were so many monitors being built by the industrial capacity of the North that they could actually, you know, just the Passaic class nine ships could have overwhelmed one of these vessels um, and by sheer numbers um, stop them. However, um, had they gotten to New York or Boston, they would have had an impact. Now, Bullock is real frustrated by his inability uh, to get these British ironclads. So he turns to France, where they think they might have an opportunity because France is a quasi-constitutional monarchy. Uh, however, the monarchy is led by Emperor Napoleon III. Well, John Slidell is going to be, now he's one of the two Confederate diplomats that are gonna be involved with the Trent Affair, other being James Mason of uh, Virginia. And so uh, basically he was formally, Seidel was formally ambassador to Mexico right before the war with Mexico. Um, and he had, you know, he basically prompted Polk, Polk to bring an army down to the Rio Grande. And he was also a U.S. Senator from Louisiana who resigned when Louisiana re, um, um, left the union. Now, so he is supposed to represent the Confederacy in Europe. Now, it just so happens that another man of great note is also operating in France and England trying to work on ironclads. And he's supposed to be doing research on submarine um, batteries for, you know, using for torpedoes. But um, this is Matthew Fontaine Marie, the great pathfinder of the sea. Um, now, he had already been interfacing with Lucien Armand. Now, Armand had been, well, he's a member of the Corps de la Slater. He has a huge shipyard in Bordeaux. And uh, uh, so they talked together and actually, Slidell is told by a close friend and true confidant of Napoleon III, Count Persine, that the French government would not interfere with the construction in French shipyard of four steam corvettes that they want to build. And uh, basically, these are going to be commerce raiders at first. Um, and two were going to be built in Armand's shipyard in Bordeaux, and two would be built in Nantes shipyard of M.J. Voriz. Um, now, I got to tell you, they got, where are they going to get the money? The Erlanger loan, which is a whole other story, but it's based on cotton certificates. So Erlanger got all these investors to say, yes, we're going to buy futures in cotton because cotton um, was needed by all these factories in Europe. And so then Mallory comes up with this concept with Bullock of building cupola rams. And these ships were definitely designed to destroy monitors. Um, now there is uh, Louis Napoleon. Um, and this is before he's prince, president of the Republic, but soon he becomes uh, uh, emperor. Uh, and he's crowned emperor as Napoleon III. Okay. Now. The Confederates had envisioned these Armand built um, ironclads would be about 172 feet in length, 33 foot beam with twin screws, screws and twin rudders and twin keels to operate in the shallow confines of the um, southern harbors and rivers. The armor was definitely designed to withstand shots from a 15 inch shell gun. There he is, Louis Armand, right? And uh, uh, he, uh, so the hull was protected by armor belt of 4.7 inches um, that extended almost seven feet below the waterline, backed by 15 inches of teak. The bow fixed turrets 
Ah, yes. Now, why they call them turrets, I'm not sure because they're round, but they're not really round when we see the different pictures. But notice these are guns in pivot. Uh, they're fixed turrets. But nevertheless, this gives them a great field of fire, right? And um, uh, the, the bow turret is plated by 4.5 inches of iron and the aft turret, as you can see, is going to be plated by 4.5 inch iron and, uh, uh, and excuse me, the aft turret's four inches of armor. In reality, these ships, now Mallory wanted to have them with eight uh, cannon, but eventually they will really have um, three guns. And that's really all they need because one is a 300 pounder Armstrong rifle in the bow turret and two 70 pounder Armstrong rifles in the aft turret. These are muzzle loading rifles. But I gotta tell you, this, these, the ship is going to, have, oh, there's the forward um, so-called turret, but you can tell it's not, but look how the pivot mount is going to work. Um, so you got really excellent field of fire. Um, and uh, as I said, it's gonna have two crew, two screws, two rudders and two keels uh, because they knew where this ship was going to be operating. The eventual overall length is going to be 186.9 feet, which included, oh my gosh, there you have it, a 11 foot ram. And this is the real, now notice how big this ship is because you can see two people in the gun port, right? And uh, so uh, basically it's, uh, I'm going to need a complement of 135 men and a speed, now remember monitors go about seven knots. This ship is going to go 10.5 knots. It was planned to be 12 knots, but during its sea trials, it will turn out to be just, um, um, you know, 10.8 uh, knots. That's pretty good if you ask me. Since the funding was to come from the Erlanger loan, um, Bullock had to work with John Slidell. And Slidell decided this is the great opportunity because in spring 1863, what is happening? Number one, the Confederates have won this great victory at the Battle of Chancellorville, which basically... Uh, you know, all of Europe is a buzz with the resurgence Confederacy and, you know, one more great victory. And maybe uh, the European nations might recognize him, especially France, because at this time, what is France doing? You're quite correct in thinking they have invaded um Mexico, and they'd done so at first because Mexico reneged on these debts. And so the French and the Spanish and the English actually go over there to try and force the Mexicans to um, pay their loans. Louis Napo Napoleon decides, oh no, we're going to stay there. He creates, of course, um, the M empire of Mexico and with Maximilian as emperor, a uh, Habsburg monarch. Um, so Slidell thinks now is the time for me to get Napoleon's personal approval for the construction of these two ironclads. Um, the, the, this, um, this is, of course, the stone wall uh, before it becomes the stone wall, I think. Uh, and um, uh, this is, in essence, um, uh, it has a sister ship, um, which is never named by the Confederacy at all. Um, so basically, given the French deep investment in Mexico, they need the Confederacy to support them. So Slidell believes through diplomatic action, Napoleon will say, yes, I agree. They're being built for the Confederacy, which is out and out almost recognition of the Confederacy. My gosh. So Slidell met with the emperor uh, on 18 June in 1863. 
now, much to the dismay of Slidell, that the emperor said, yes, 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 you can build the ships in, in France, and I'm happy about it, but you cannot build them openly for the Confederacy. Emperor Napoleon said that it could only go ahead with the construction if their destination is concealed. Well, Bullock immediately moves forward um, with the uh, contract with uh, Armand. And, uh, and so Armand says, oh, yes, we're going to make sure the ships are going to be released to the um, uh, Confederate Navy. Now, a code story, now Bullock should have thought better because he used a code story to get the lard rams saying Egypt was involved, right? The Sultan of Egypt wanted them, and so that's why they're being built. Sadly, he does the same with these two rams that are being built in Bordeaux. And so this code story said that one was going to be the Cheops, which is this one, and the other one was going to be the Sphinx, um, and they were being built for the uh, Egyptian Khedive. Now, despite all this subterfuge, the purpose of these ironclads are going to be um, learned about uh, because and now the minister to um, France at this time is Michael Drayton. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately for him, you know, the, the federals are doing all the subterfuge. They're bribing people. They want to know what's happening. So a clerk at the MJ Voruz shipyard that were building two of those Corvettes walks in to the U.S. ambassador's office in Paris with all these documents and said, hey, they're lying about where these ships are going. These are being built specifically for the Confederacy. Look at these documents. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Drayton is going to take advantage of this. They are so shocked about the power of these ironclads that actually Drayton will write. Would, had these ships been delivered to the Confederacy, they would have posed the greatest peril uh, to which the American Union had ever been exposed. However, once the story is out, the French government refused to allow the ships to leave port with a Confederate destination. Bullock later lamented, there was never any pretense of concealing them from the emperor's government because they were undertaken at its instigation. In other words, the French government said, yeah, come and build them, come and build them. You know, because everyone's experimenting with ironclads at this time. So, and France and England are actually in um, a naval race. Well, what's going to happen is that, of course, Armand, who's got a big investment in the four Corvettes and also these two ironclads, Fortunately for him, there's another war going on in Europe, and it's known as the Second Schleswig War. I know that's on the exam at the, after the end, but, um, you know, the Prussians are trying to expand the border of what is commonly known now as Schleswig-Holstein, and they actually will annex some of the Danish land, which then gets turned back to the Danes after the Versailles uh, Treaty in 1919. So anyway, um, uh, the, the big thing is they're fighting Prussia. So Armand says, hey, you want to buy these ironclads? They go, sure, we do. In fact, um, the Sphinx was sold to Denmark, which would be renamed the Stadtkolder, and the Cheops was, named, was sold to Prussia as the Prince Aldebert. Now, I have to tell you, because of this foreign enlistment concept that they refused to release the ships to Denmark until that war was over. It's a very quick war. Um, and of course, Prussia versus the Danes, you can figure that one out. Um, and uh, uh, so the Strachholder was delivered to Copenhagen and guess what? The Danes said, we don't want it, we don't need it. And so here is they, they, they back out of the contract. Well, who's there is waiting? 
Well, I got to tell you, it is James Bullock. Um, and James Bullock will purchase the ship from Denmark. And um, on 6 January 1865, the ship will leave Copenhagen, yes, with a Danish crew, but commanded by... Captain Thomas Jefferson Page. Now, all you all who live here in Virginia, you've been to Rosewell over in Gloucester. That's where he was born. Yes, he was named for Thomas Jefferson. His father was Man Page, a uh, governor of Virginia. And believe it or not, father of 14 children. Um, and uh, Page uh, basically um, had served in the U.S. Navy from 1827 to 1865. Um, now, he was one of the famous thing he did was in 1848, he was commanding the Plymouth and the Far East Squadron. And he then took the little brig Dolphin uh, and battled Japanese pirates in the Yangtze Sea. So, you know, he is a, a pretty dynamic officer, but he's also considered a scientific officer. Ergo, why? I'm getting him signed to what? Our new ironclad. Now, he is most famous for his work, uh, hydrographic um, study of the um, Rio uh, de la Plata Basin uh, from 1853 to 1856. He is actually in a ship called the USS Water Witch, which has an incident. But they went up and discovered all these great tributaries uh, and charted them. And this has never been done before. So this is great for Paige. Well... I have to tell you, Paige um, sailed his, um, or steamed, I think would be better said, steamed his ship to Curon Bay uh, and met with a rendezvous with the city of Richmond. This is a blockade runner commanded by Lieutenant Hunter Davison of the CSS Virginia fame. And they met on 24 January 1865. Uh, Hunter Davidson had bought supplies, food, and everything. Coal. Now, believe it or not, the Stonewall, as it will be commissioned, uh, will actually carry 227 tons of coal. But I'm going to tell you all right now, that gave it a range of 3,000 miles. So, this vessel is designed not only to sink monitors, but also to uh, make it across the ocean so it can sink monitors. Now, um, when in Quiron Bay, uh, Page is uh, going to write Mallory, which he sends a letter with Hunter Davison, you must not expect too much of me. I fear that the power and effect of this vessel has been too much exaggerated we will do our best. Now, remember, this is January 24, 1865. So here I got a Confederate crew. However, after leaving Quiberon Bay, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Stonewall springs a leak. Here's Page. Um, and this is while before the war. You know, after the war, he sets up a uh, southern Argentine community. And, and believe it or not, I did a, a lecture to his descendants and 90% of them spoke Spanish. You know, I mean, they were from Argentina. So anyway, long story short, um, we are going to uh, uh, bring a very bad leak because of heavy storms. So um, the um, Stonewall is going to put in um, eventually to El Farol and to where the Spanish have some excellent shipyards and they're allowed to have the ship repaired. Um, now, the Federals know all about this going on. So they send two powerful ships to watch the Stonewall and to stop it from leaving Spain. They're nine miles off. And basically um, the squadron is commanded, uh, two ship squadron commanded by uh, Thomas Tunis Craven, right? And uh, he is in actual command of the USS Niagara, which was a, almost sister ship to the Merrimack class, but it had several different improvements. Uh, it was built at Brooklyn Navy Yard. It was the largest ship built in the U.S. 
by the U.S. Navy at that time. It was called a frigate, but actually it was just an oversized sloop uh, with a clipper type hull designed by George Steers. I got to tell you, it gets refitted in 1862. It's 345 feet in length. It's got a 55.3 foot beam. It's got a draft of 24.8 feet. A complement of, believe it or not, 660. 655 men. It had a speed of 14.5 knots. And let me tell you, its armament is really pretty powerful. Um, and because it has 12 150 pounder rifles, 20 11 inch shell guns, one 24 pounder howitzer, and two 12 pounder rifles. Now, added to that was the sloop USS Sacramento, which was 229 feet, 0.6 uh, feet in length, had a draft of 8.10 feet, had a speed of 12.5 knots. Let me tell you, it's armament. One 150-pounder gun right, rifle, two 11-inch shell guns, one 30-pounder rifle, two 24-pounder howitzers, two 12-pounder rifles, and oh my gosh, two 12-pounder shell guns. Oh my gosh, what a powerful ray. And they're waiting for the ship to come out. Now the Stonewall is going to, you know, the clock is ticking. The Stonewall is going to leave um, uh, Spain on the 24th of March. And Craven will be refused to engage the Stonewall. Now, Page came out ready to fight. He had the Confederate flag. He was steaming back and forth in front of him. Come and get me. Um, but Craven writes Gideon Wells, the Stonewall is a very formidable vessel, about 175 feet long, brig rick, and completely clothed in iron plates of five inches in thickness. Under top gallon fire castle in her casemate, Armstrong 30 pounder rifle gun. In a turret abaft her main mast are two 120 pounder rifle guns. She has two smaller guns mounted in broadside. If as fast as refuted to be, in smooth water, she, are, she ought to be more than a match for three such ships as the Niagara. So Craven refuses to engage the Stonewall, right? And uh, uh, actually, he finishes his letter to Gideon Wells, Secretary of Navy for the Union. At this time, the odds in her favor were too great and too certain, in my humble judgment, to admit of the slightest hope of being able to inflict upon her the most terrifying injury, whereas if we had gone out, the Niagara would have most undoubtedly been easily and promptly destroyed so thoroughly a one-sided combat I did not consider myself called upon to engage. So Craven lets this ship uh, go to Lisbon and then head towards the Confederacy. Oh my gosh, you know, Craven is going to be court-martialed and relieved. He's found remiss in his duties. He's suspended from the Navy for two years. Uh, they you know, reduce that to just a couple months. And um, because everyone's afraid of this vessel, look at it. Think about the monitor. Think about even the new iron sides. Think about this ram. Think about its armor protection. Think about a 30 pounder Armstrong gun with solid shot could easily break through a turret. So this is a big trouble. So I gotta tell you, <clears throat> So the Stonewall sails all the way to Nassau, um, where she'll arrive on the 6th of May, um, and they refuse to deal with the ship. So on to Havana goes the Stonewall. Now, I have to tell you, at this moment, think about the date, arrives in Havana, 11 May. What has happened? Well, Lee has surrendered, Joe Johnson has surrendered, the Confederacy is collapsing, Jefferson Davis has been captured. So this is really bad news. So Page sells the ship 
to the um, uh, general uh, governor of Cuba for $16,000. And then, um, you know, goes, uh, he actually goes into exile in uh, Alabama. Now this, oh my gosh, this is the ship at the Washington Navy Yard. Look at the ram. So America reimburses the Spanish uh, to buy the Stonewall just so that they can control it. Because actually, when the Stonewall makes it to Havana and negotiations are going on, they sent several monitors and other warships to guard against the Stonewall deciding we're going to attack the uh, southern coastline because Page had wanted to go to Port Royal Sound destroy the South Atlantic blockading squadron's um, base, destroying every monitor he could see. Uh, he was uh, pretty intent. Well, now, all of a sudden, what are we going to do with this ironclad? Well, basically, there is a big problem in Japan. And that problem in Japan is known as the Meiji Restoration. That's right. Uh, the Togawa shogunate was being overthrown by the Meiji emperor. And, uh, and, you know, because the Japanese, ever since Matthew Galbraith Perry showed up at um, in Japan, they go, oh, my gosh. You know, they've got cannon, they've got this, they got that, steamships. We don't have any of that. Do we want to go the way of Indonesia? Do we want to go the way of the Philippines? No. So there's this effort to modernize, which the shogunate says, no, 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 we want to look backwards. We like our matchlock muskets. We like our bows and arrows. So there is an uprising. The Meiji uh, emperor is able uh, to actually... Uh, take over most of Japan. However, the island of Okada um, will become the Enzo Republic led by the Togonga sh um, Shogunate. Now, the Shogunate buys the ship from the U.S. Navy. However, when it gets to Japan, they refuse to turn it out to the shogunate. Instead, they will eventually negotiate and give it to the, um, uh, the uh, emperor and his government. And this ship is going to play a critical role in two different battles, 25 March, 1862, Battle of Makaido Bay, and then also the conclusive uh, six-day battle for mm, mm, four to 10 May, 1869, known as the Naval Battle of Hei Kodet. Okay, so uh, um, it really had, uh, its first name was Ironclad, known as uh, Tissue, and I don't speak uh, Japanese. Um, however, uh, I really think I know that it renamed as the Azuma, which is another is the Japanese word for East. The ship will be the pride of the Imperial Navy for about five years. But you know, actually, as soon as this ship hit the water, it was almost outmoded. And so, on twenty nine. January 1888, it was stricken from the Imperial Japanese uh, Navy list and sold for scrap on 12 December 1889. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, um, this is a, um, uh, a ship that uh, became famous because of what it did for the Japanese. Could it have changed the outcome of the Civil War? The answer, even though it was designed to handle 15-inch shot, which, as we know, um, damaged any uh, Confederate ironclad like the Tennessee, the Atlanta, uh, the 15-inch shot, we're going to break the casemates of those ships. So one ship versus 20 monitors is uh, uh, not going to result in a great Confederate victory. But for a time, this ship could have tipped the balance slightly. The trouble is it's 65. 
The Confederates needed these ships in 1862, 1863. So it would have had a chance to really deal with the, um, the monitors. And actually, these ships are designed to operate, not only to be ocean going, but to also, I mean, the Stonewall has a draft of 14.5 feet. So it could not only go across the ocean, it could also operate in shallow bays, rivers and harbors of the Confederacy. That's why it's got the twin screws. That's why it's got the twin uh, keels, the twin rudders. So it could really maneuver within those uh, tight confines of, of, of various places. And that draft was going to make them able to actually do that. Uh, it had the Stonewall come to Hampton Roads in 1863. We may be writing history slightly differently, but I do not believe that um, this ship could have really dealt with all the monitors that existed. So that's kind of the story of the CSS Stonewall. Uh, I spent a little time explaining the European ironclads, my blog that I'm still working on because, um, you know, I, I, I'm dealing with the... Uh, um, uh, these are the officers of the Azuma right there, and that's at the Battle of Hey Codet, and uh, there it is, uh, and Japanese service. Um, so um, I thank you for paying attention today. What an amazing topic. Uh, my blog is going to actually deal with the entire object of construction of European ironclads and the impact of I ran out of time, I noticed. I got a little verbose, uh, verbose I guess. So anyway, uh, uh, you know, you're welcome to ask me any questions. There's my email address. Um, gosh, we're going to have this posted on a our YouTube channel uh, in about a week. Uh, the blog will be up in about two weeks. Um, if you like what you heard today, uh, the stories included in my book, uh, history of ironclads and so it's all fun and thank you for being here and now here's julie murphy with whatever questions you have we do have a couple nope. um kevin asked why didn't the union try to buy ironclads from europe well they didn't because they thought they didn't need to uh -huh. You know, the victory, well, the, the success of the monitor, and I can't say that the monitor won a victory on March 9th, but they knew they had their own industrial plant. The, the trouble is they went with a design that was not very ocean going, as we know from what happens to the monitor, et cetera. Um, so they didn't think they needed to. The Confederacy could not build a turret. It could not uh, um, really make an ironclad uh, like what you what what we saw. Um, this is the better picture um, right there. Uh, and this is a powerful ship. The ram alone, you stick that in the side of a monitor. Where is the monitor going? Down. Down. So you know the the question is the question of numbers you know, the North industrial plant is able to produce so many ships that even a vessel like the Stonewall or uh, the CSS North Carolina or Mississippi uh, may have had initial success, but um, uh, they probably would have been overwhelmed by numbers, but we just don't know. I don't like to guess at history, uh, but uh, had this made it to um, uh, the Confederacy in 1864, um, much would have been changed in the war. Who, who gave Thomas Jefferson Page the authority to sell the ship? And who got the $16,000 that Spain paid for it? Well, no one gave him the authority because there was no Confederate government uh, by this time. By May 11th, uh, Abraham, I mean, um, Jefferson Davis had been captured. Um, and so, uh, you know, he's kind of on his own. He sees, you know, the various, um, you know, Union monitors has been in Dothoff and some other ships that were right outside of Anna. Uh, he knew he could take them on, um, but he also knew the war was over. So his crew, Need to be paid. 
So he sold the ship uh, to Cuba for $16,000, exactly what he needed to pay off the crew. Uh, they were offered more money, but they said, no, no they don't want it. You know? And so um, uh, Spain um, didn't see the need for this ironclad and the United States wanted to have it because they did not want to see a foreign power with this powerful ship. Now, they were very afraid of the ship. T.T. Um, T. Craven is not a coward, I have to tell you. He just knew, look at that ram, look at that 300-pounder Armstrong, and I got a wooden ship, and they're firing explosive shells at me. Where am I going to be? down in Davy Jones' locker. So uh, he made a prudent decision, but the trouble with the American public at the time is, oh my gosh, you're not going to sit there and let that thing go out to sea and come to America. It's like Franklin Buchanan said, um, you know, he was on the Tennessee and he, this is a paraphrase, that, you know, on, on, when he's going out to take on the entire Union fleet and the Anchorage and Mobile Bay, he says, uh, I will be damned for all time if I do not make this attempt. In other words, I got me an ironclad. I want to use it. I got me a powerful ship and there is an ironclad. I need to deal with it somehow. And um you know, uh, I personally think uh, the Stonewall uh, would have sank both the uh, uh, Niagara and the Sacramento. I mean, shells, uh, shot proof. Uh, they don't have 15 inch Dahlgrens. There you go. 150 Parrot gun. Um, did it have the penetrating power? Um, that's never been tested. So I, I can't say. Well, it's definitely a formidable vessel. And yes. um, everyone has really enjoyed learning more about it and thank you for that john next mm -hmm. friday we will explore the battle of wausau sound georgia with lots more ships to talk about and um, we're looking for some great maps that we can show fernando and those that are way far away from savannah and georgia um, what area we're talking about. So we're, we're yes. working on that now. This and is all about the, uh, uh, the CSS Atlanta. So in proof, here is a Confederate built ironclad using Scottish engines, had everything it has, but it had too great of a draft. And so consequently, uh, it will five shots from the Weehawken, right? Five shots, two 11 inch, three 15 inch, breaks the casemate of the Atlanta and knocks off the top of the uh, pilot house. So, and that's it, that, that's five shots and they destroy one of the better Confederate ironclads, which unfortunately had around a grand. So anyway. Some great uh, artwork of that too, we'll share next week. Oh yes, I can't wait. And thank you all so much for joining us. We're, we're thrilled to have you. We look forward to continuing virtual programs as well as starting up some in-person programs um, not, too, not too long from now. But thank you, have a great weekend. And John, thank you as always for your sharing your expertise and we appreciate all of you. Thank, thank you, you. sink before surrender, right? right. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.